Welcome everybody, my name is Lucas de Man. Um, let me see if I can do it like this. <laughs> yes, my name is Lucas de Man. Uh, I'm the artistic director of company New Heroes. We are based in Amsterdam, but myself, I'm a Belgian. So if people think like you don't look Dutch, it's true, I'm Belgian made. Uh, I'm also a TV host here in the Netherlands. I'm also a TFM. Actually, I'm many different things because I'm a young person. I'm in the last generation. So when people ask me, what is it that you do? I always say that I'm a creator. That means that I'm professionally creative. That means that sometimes people pay me to be creative. Uh, my organization is called Company New Heroes. Just to give you a short insight, uh, we call ourselves a professional creative company, so with professional creative people. We do storytelling, we do concepts, and we do bio-based creations, creating with nature. And that means that we have all kinds of projects. We create books, we create movies, theater, installations, and so on. And what I want to uh, say to you is the way we work is always the same. We follow our gut. We choose a topic that we think we have to do something, then we always do research, and then we choose which forms we want to do it, with what team, and how are we going to make it. But it starts with our gut, and then research is first very, very important. Uh, I'm saying this because I want to talk to you about a project that we've been doing now for two years called In Search of Democracy 3.0. And a lot of people have asked us, Democracy 3.0, what was 2.0 and what was 1.0? So um, I'll come to that, relax, easy. Uh, but what I want to show you now is the reason why we started this project. Because we saw research that showed, this is a research um, that is done for 30 years, where every year they ask people, how essential do you think it is to live in a democracy? You know? And what you see is that every year, less and less people thought it was important, and especially the young. So it's not because you're young that you don't think it's important, it's the young of those days. So, and you can see it's 1980, that means that it's like, say, all the young people. They haven't done it with the very young ones, like you, you know? But let's say people that are now 40 are less invested in democracy than people that are older. And what I also think is interesting is that the low point of Sweden is still higher than the high point of the Netherlands. And I can say that because I live here. So the next thing was that we saw this research. People asked, do you want a strong leader in your country who puts things right? 80% almost in the United Kingdom and France said, yes, we want a strong leader. Only in Germany, apparently, they still remember history. But to be very honest, the young people in that German research also asked for a strong leader. Whatever that, I mean, it can be democratic, but for us it was like, okay, times are changing. Let's do a project about where are we going with democracy? Because if we don't think it's essential, if we don't think it's important, then we might lose what we have. So we started with a team, all kinds of different people from all to young, all colors from everywhere, uh, filmmakers, journalists, researchers, theater people. And we've done a few things. You can check it on the website. We are making short documentaries about innovators. We have a live performance, a show that tours all over Europe that we talk with the audience about what they think is necessary and essential. And we do a lot of uh, papers and research that we publish, right? This is the first thing we've done, take a team. The second thing we've done is look back at history because if you want to look forward, right? You have to look back at history. Where did democracy start? Western democracy, so 1.0. And it started in Athens. And we know exactly the date, 508 before Christ, because that punker that you see, that punk guy who's waving his hand, is called Pericles. And he was doing a eulogy. You know, when someone dies, that you do a whole speech. And he was doing a eulogy. And in that eulogy, he said, we need demos kratos. We need that people, demos, have power kratos. And everybody felt silent. They were like, what? are you saying Pericles? Because before that, it was just one or two guys who were running the city. And now this Pericles is saying everybody should get power. All right? Not everybody, not the women and the strangers and the foreigners and the slaves and the children, all them not. But let's say all, all white men could, you know, which was a bit already a big change. It was a whole, I mean, that meant like 100 people could decide on the power of Athens. And we know so much about that democracy 1.0 because a lot of people wrote about it that they hated it, especially the Spartans. They were like, what is happening in Athens, you know, with this innovative way of dealing with power, you know? We don't like it. Every week there was someone from Sparta running to Athens shouting, losers, stop it. But the Athens didn't, you know? 
For 120 years, they kept having this democracy. And then after 120 years, not many people know that, they decided to stop it because there was too much problem with the Spartans, you know, too much fighting. So they wanted a strong leader again. So democracy 1.0 lasted for 120 years and then it was over. And then we got the Romans and the Catholic Church and so on and so on and so on. And many people think, you know, that democracy went from nothing to amazing now, you know, in the 20th century. But it's not true. If you look at history, you see it actually going up and down and up and down. During the Roman period, there were times that were way more democratic than others. The Catholic Church, not very democratic, but there were times that there were more. And then actually we were like, okay, when did 2.0 start? And what you see, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to understand when exactly did democracy 2.0, like we know it now, start. What I do know is that it's very late until all of the countries in the European Union became democratic. You could say, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, could be, could be, but then you had, of course, Yugoslavia. So we say, actually, let's say for the last 20 years, officially, officially, the countries in the European Union are democratic officially 20 years i'm almost 40 i know i don't look like it but still i'm almost 40 that means that i'm two times the age of democracy in the european union it's super super young and still some countries are sort of you know declining it that was our history lesson at least we thought that that was our history lesson but i lied to you because democracy did not start in greece in Athens. I mean, we are taught that, you know, at school, I was in Belgium at school, and you have these teachers telling me, oh, the Greek, they were so amazing. Look at Pericles and his hair and everything is so cool. You know, you should bow down, Lucas, and say, thank you for civilization, Greeks, which I did because I was young, you know, I just did what my teachers told me. But they lied. They lied about Santa Claus. They lied about the beginning of democracy because it started with the Phoenicians, you know, 1500 before Christ. They already had the equality of people. They already had civilian rights, 1500 before Christ. It's not that the Greeks, you know, woke up one day with an apple on their head thinking, Eureka, let's do democracy. They got those ideas from the Phoenicians that came, you know, doing trade, that came over every year talking about their great laws they had, you know. But it did not start in Phoenician as well. The Phoenicians got it from the Mesopotamians. You know, Mesopotamia is in Iraq, Syria, the contemporary Iraq, Syria, you have Mesopotamia. They already had 3000 before Christ, three amazing elements. First of all, freedom and equality for all civilians. So not the slaves, but men, women, children, all of them. Second of all, they already had a legal framework. The Code of Hammurabi is the oldest, one of the oldest legal texts in the world, writing down the rights of people. And third, as you can read it there, voting. And how did the Mesopotamians vote? Their system was very simple. If there was a problem, everybody came together and the men could speak. I know it was the men, but still they could speak. And when somebody spoke and you agreed with that person, you kneeled down. I can do it now, but then you don't see me anymore. And people go like, oh, where did he go? So you kneel down. And the great thing is, if the men couldn't agree on the solutions, the children and the women could also start voting. So they had a lot of times that everybody voted, 3,000 before Christ. This we didn't know. I mean, you, of course, knew this or because you are super smart and into democracy, but I didn't know this. I thought that it all started with the Greeks. So I learned two lessons. First of all, Western democracy started in Syria. In Syria, I mean, where are we are fighting already for three years, bombing the country, saying that we're going to bring democracy, they brought it to us. And secondly, people lie all the time to us. You know, we think that we know history because we just repeat what people tell us. You have to do your own research to know how things are. Okay, so we know that people lie. We know that it started in Syria. So we went looking to the rest of the world, you know, and the rest of history. And what you see is all over the world, you see, I mean, it's not democracy like we know now, but all over the world, everywhere in history, there have been tribes and cultures that had the idea of how can we mix the power between people and the rulers everywhere from even China in Africa, everywhere. 
and the oldest form of a democratic system we found 40,000 years ago. Not me personally, I didn't find it, but we found people who found it, you know. 40,000 years ago, you cannot say the Aboriginals anymore. I learned that as well. You have to say the Atsi, the indigenous peoples of Australia. And they had this great system. They lived in tribes, sometimes 50 people, 60 people. But when they had problems with other tribes, they came together and they started discussing it. And they had to reach consensus because they didn't do voting. So they had to reach consensus. And you could talk and talk until everybody reached consensus. And the second thing they did is, if they had a problem and somebody, I mean, something was part of that problem, for example, the trees or the river, that thing also got representative. So somebody spoke in name of the trees, in name of the river, in name of whatever that was part of the problem that was not humane and couldn't speak for itself. Because they, they understood we are part of a bigger system and we are responsible for everything that has a name and no name, everything that can speak and not speak. 40,000 years ago. And they wrote that down the way they thought 5,000 years ago. So what you see, and the reason I'm doing this, and I know for some people you go like, oh, I want to go to innovation. Now, now we're going to history. Lucas, what is this? You know? Well, the reason I'm saying this is because for me, I realize democracy is, of course, dividing and organizing the power and responsibility. Yeah, and having systems for it. But moreover, it is, for me, it is a nonstop search for how can we live together? How can we live together as people? So I don't see democracy versus tyranny or democracy versus oligarchy. I see democracy as the basic, you know, and sometimes we give it away and sometimes we don't. Sometimes it becomes completely corrupt and sometimes not. But the basis is that we try to find how to work together, how to live together and who gets what kind of power to do that. So that means that it's constantly changing because let's be honest, we have no idea what we are doing as people. Let me pause on that because a lot of people have an idea what they are doing practically. But philosophically, we are born, we walk around this world, and we have no idea, right? What is the use of life? Anyways, I have no idea, right? But you have no idea as well. I think that's the essence. The moment that we understand, you know that we are the only animal that knows that they don't know what the essence of life is. Because all the other animals just have no idea, and it's okay. You know, they just go around, sniff their own butts, and that's cool. You know, we also snub each other's butts, but we think like maybe we'll understand what we're doing here. And every time again, we realize we have no concrete clue what it is that we're doing here. So people, right, come together, not knowing, searching for answers, and they all want to hear and be heard and seen. That is what it says here. People need to feel heard and seen. So again, what is democracy? It's a lot of people that have no clue about the essence of life coming together to search together and the hope that someone sees and feels them. That is what they want, be heard and be seen. So democracy is constantly changing. So innovators are people who are up with the times because they see the society changing. That means that democracy will change as well. It's not set in stone. So it will always change whether we do something or whether we don't do something because society changes. This was my speech. No, the most important thing, right, that we came up with, okay, let's look at democratic innovations. And because there's so much innovations and we found Participedia. I don't know if you know Participedia. It's participedia.net. And it's an amazing website of 40 universities all over the world that are collecting all the innovations that are happening on democratic uh, level, and they are checking whether it works or not. So they keep up whether it's working or not. You see it all over the world, even in the middle of the ocean, people are innovating democracy. Don't know how it's happening there, but it's happening in the ocean, as you can see. You know? So it's, it's amazing. Uh, this website, just check it out if you want to see it. It's now already at 2,800, actually. This is an old picture that I shared with you. So it's constantly, if your idea is not there yet, please tell them because they are keeping track of it. So what we've done with our show is that first looked at history, then realized how important it is that people actually are constantly thinking, how can we divide power? How can we make sure that we are heard and seen? Because that's the essence of democracy, that I as a person feel that I am part, that somebody sees me for who I am, even though I might be different than the majority or the leaders or whatever. 
right? So we said, okay, let, let's look at Participedia, 2,800 initiatives, a little bit too much. So let's find out if there are categories that we can divide them in. These are the six categories of innovation that we discovered. And what we do in the performance is that we show an example per category. But what we will do now is that we show a person who's doing an innovation within that category. And we chose the categories and the people. So the people may not, may, I mean, they are of course in all categories, but we just attach the person to each category. So what we're gonna do now is, I'm gonna say one of the categories, and then I'm gonna invite a person from somewhere in Europe to talk about their initiative that they're doing within this category. Yes. So we begin with a better representation. And by that, of course, we mean that people who represent us, which is a system within democracy, right? it's one of the possible systems. Somebody represents a bigger group. Now it's almost always the same kind of people who represent everybody, right? They're highly educated. Most of them are white. They smell sometimes. And they are mostly men, sometimes women. But, you know, it's all like a very thin, thin line. Um, we need way more different kinds of people to do that. So we need a better representation. Talking here about better representation towards a deliberative democracy is PhD, author of many books and person in real life, Martin Gerwin. Martin, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Looking so professional. All right. So uh, um, what we do in Poland, and we promote it all over the world, actually, is we organize the citizens' assemblies with a randomly selected group, which includes several demographic criteria, such as gender, uh, age groups, uh, education, and others. And in this way, we create a microcosm of a community. It can be a microcosm of a city or the country. So in this term, you could say it's a great representation because you include the demographic categories in your pool of people. It can be 50 people, it can be 100 people, but definitely, it reflects the com demographic composition of a society. And, and how, do, how do people get chosen? At random. Yeah, but, but like... Uh, oh, okay. or, yes, or... so um, uh, at the first stage is sending out letters with invitations, for example, and uh, people who would like to register to participate, they um, go to a special website or call by phone. And then from this group who has uh, confirmed their willingness to participate, there is a, the final stage of random selection, and we do it in Poland by rolling a dice. Well, that's a great way of doing things. Just roll a dice. Uh, and then... People are selected. Do they participate? Do you see that it works actually? Or do you see a lot of people declining, saying, no, thank you, and no, you end up with the same people anyway? No, no, it definitely works. But uh, Lucas, this is the topic of my presentation. I cannot tell everything now. Ooh, very good, very good, Martin. All right, let the people hanging. So people afterwards, so we're gonna show all five people and then you can choose with whom you want to discuss more. But the great thing is you have two rounds. So you can have two of the five people, which is, just below half, right? So you get that 40%, you can follow, and the rest, who knows what happened? You will miss out. So for those with FOMO, too bad. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much. Uh, I will continue with the next category. It's between people. And I, I, I must be honest, um, this morning, the person who was going to talk about between people canceled because uh, he or she was, was not between people. So I will show you what, um, what we were talking about. And um, one of the uh, examples that we show in the, in the show, in our showcase, is called Nuance Through Visualization. And by that, we go to Taiwan. Uh, to Polis, the origining of Polis. So you all know Taiwan. Uh, in Taiwan, the government wanted to pass a law that says from now on you can buy and sell alcohol online. Well, 50% of the population in Taiwan said, no, don't do this. The other 50% said, yes, do it. And they had this for six months, just yes and no. And it didn't move. The government almost fell over it, you know, because they couldn't convince either of the sides until two young people said, you know what, why don't we ask the people why they are against or pro this law, you know, instead of just saying yes or no, and just visualize 
the nuance. And then it turned out to be that a lot of people had emotional arguments. For example, maybe my children will buy alcohol and I will never know, or maybe my liquor store will go bankrupt and so on. So the government said, oh, but these things we can change in the law, chick, 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 because we could see the nuance and then the law was passed with 75%. So the idea is don't ask just, are you pro or against, remain or leave? Ask people why, visualize it, and then the nuance will reign. It was a great story, but we will not tell it to you because the person is not here telling about it. So I will not explain what nuanced revisualization is. I will continue to the next category, more involved voting. So the idea of voting is part of democracy, doesn't have to be, it's one of the possibilities. People always think democracy, ah, that's voting. Uh -uh -uh. Voting is just a system, just an idea to enhance democracy. It's one of the possibilities. And there are many ways to do this voting. And one of them is liquid democracy. And for that, I invited all the way from Berlin, Moritz Ritter. Moritz, are you there? I am there, hi. Hi, please tell us, liquid democracy. Has it anything to do with alcohol? <laughs> I wish, I wish, no, actually there's uh, lots of, um, of e-cigarette uh, brands that are called liquid right now. So we have problems with that um, currently. No, nothing with ACO. It's more about like making democracy more transparent and inclusive actually. And not just voting. As you said, it's like the process also before the voting, the whole discussion that happens until you ask the question yes or no, or uh, have the different options to vote for. That's actually the process that is super interesting to us and to bring that online and then involve more people in it via the internet. That's what we are trying to do with our software autocracy. So it's, 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 it's the process plus using technology to make people actually more involved so that voting is not just pressing a button without knowing what you're doing, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think that the question that you ask, like, for example, the question with Brexit, do you want to stay in? The European Union or not is not really that that's like the point you know you have to ask the right question and then you get the best results um, similar to what you just showed for Taiwan and yeah that's why the process that happens before the voting is so crucial and it's also like I would say the bigger focus right now than voting for us um, with our software. Oh cool so you and because you say software the whole time so you invented the software I know you're going to give a presentation in the breakout sessions but, but for those who don't are not going to be there it's a software that helps people be more what informed or be more involved when it comes to voting? No, it's actually a software that uh, makes you that makes it possible to discuss in a structured way about um, different issues and yeah, to basically make it uh, less uh, like a better discussion culture than you find on Facebook or any of these platforms that are used but were never built for, for political discussions. It's a better discussion forum than Facebook. That's already a very low bench to reach, but okay. That is true. <laughs> I'm very curious, Moritz. Uh, for the people who want to go with Moritz, you can have to, one of the two rounds you can choose and learn more about liquid democracy, how technology can make us discuss and talk better, actually. Thank you so much, Moritz. We'll come back to you. Then the fundamentals of our time. And what we mean by that is that you can actually change the real basics that we have. For example, uh, the, the human rights law, or for example, the constitution, that you can rewrite a constitution with the people of a country, for example, like they've done in Iceland. So all the way from Iceland, Katrin, did I say it right? Catherine Perfect. Otsdottir. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine Otsdottir, are you there? And, I am. and please, did you, you're a lawyer, you're a lecturer at the university, did you rewrite with people the whole yeah. constitution of Iceland? We did. Back uh, after the economic, economic crash in 2008, we had huge protests. Everyone was crazy angry. Uh, and thank you, by the way, for this, Lucas, you're great. And, and this is fun. And it's beautiful that somebody's thinking about this, you know, how do we develop our democracy? Uh, in Iceland, we, we did sort of hate the war because we had a, a total economic uh, meltdown like the rest of the world, but we were the first to go under, sort of. So people were looking at Iceland, what will they do? And we had to really kick out our government at the time by protesting. And then we had to try to figure out a way to make this sort of Iceland 2.0. Uh, and that, that was done by uh, writing a new constitution, but in a more participatory way that had ever been done before. So it, it's, it has been called now the, the world, uh, world's first crowdsourced constitution, uh, basically using uh, methodology from computer science and so on to, to, to uh, test as you go along. And so we put the draft online as we were writing it each week and we got feedback from the citizens and proposals from the citizens and thereby we could make it better and also more inclusive. 
but the story does not end there unfortunately there's drama there's always drama oh and we God. still yeah 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 we still haven't got our new constitution despite it being uh, uh, approved if you like in the national referendum back in 2012 and that is a bit of about what i'm going to be talking about because i have been forced to turn into an activist to try to to finish this business you know uh, and you have we are been still forced <laughs> you have been forced to turn actually you, don't, you didn't want to be an activist but then because the government was so shitty you said you know what I'll get my inner activist out mm -hmm. and I'll fight for my constitution. Yeah, but I was I was brought up as an activist, so it's not a huge leap, but I, I still would have liked it to just be ratified, you know, it would have been easier, you know. And because I, 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 we followed, we followed actually with the, with the film crew, we followed the moment that you were going to give the constitution, the new constitution, hand it over to the government. And then it was such a delusion that the government was like, oh, thank you so much. You actually rewrote for the first time ever a constitution with a whole country, even though they're like, what? 400,000 people living in Iceland. How do you do that with so many people? And then I have the feeling, because they got less power, that the government said, uh, 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 ain't gonna do that. Is, that. is that true or is there many other reasons? Yeah, I think that's the basic reason, to be honest. Because And it's not because we have a parliament filled with Dr. Evils or anything. It's because we, uh, we always have systems that will always reject ch change. That's why they're systems. And that's a little bit sort of the, the, the lesson of this story also, is that you have to, be really patient and stubborn to, to actually maintain pressure. If a system has rejected change once, fundamentally yes. rejected something, then you really have to figure out uh, creative and innovative ways to keep picking at it until it moves, you know, and that's what we're doing at the moment up here in Iceland. Uh, and the picture you see there is a, is a part of our, our uh, activist scheme, uh, if you like. Basically, it, this is by the governmental building and uh, it was a graffiti wall and uh, artist painted, where is the new constitution? And the next Monday, this was during the weekend, it was beautiful art, I thought, and uh, because the wall was cracked before, it was all sort of just, uh, you know, randomly graffiti stuff. And, and the day after, the authorities showed up with their, 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 their water guns and took it away. A question that could not be asked, basically. No. And of course, we could, you could see a wall behind there. We did that next, and we didn't dare to take that away because there was an out, outrage uh, in the media and everywhere when they did this. And then we keep adding walls now and... <laughs> Uh, we're just uh, trying to piss them slowly off uh, to the extent that they will have to listen. I understand. I, I really like the activism. So, so for the people listening now, if you want to join Catherine uh, in the sessions, breakout sessions, please do. She will talk way more than just about graffiti and walls, but how can you fight to change the constitution? By the way, Catherine, the moment you said, you know, a system that was refusing change, we call that my father. You know, that is that is how you call it in Belgium. It's, it's your father, okay. and then picking till it changes is called a mother. Anyway, uh, let's continue. Uh, we have from childhood onwards. So the idea is that at at school you get educated in not only talking and learning about how democracy works, but also doing it, also undergoing it, feeling how it is to to not always have the same opinion, but talk about it and have a dialogue. It's very very important. And we invited all the way from Amsterdam, uh, Dilara Bilgic, who actually is, I think, the youngest democracy book author I've ever seen. I know that Martin has been writing books probably since he was five, but Dilara is 18 and already wrote a book called The Black Box uh, Democracy. Dilara, are you there? Dilara, are you there? She's probably writing a book yes, at the I'm moment. Here. <laughs> Hi, oh Lara. no, I was just listening to your performance. <laughs> Thank you. Tell us, tell us, the Gen, Gen Z manifesto it says here, what, what, is, what is it? Uh, yeah, well, I'm currently working on a project that is uh, all about activating youngsters to come up with ideas to think about their democracy or uh, about European democracy. Uh, so that's actually what this Gen Z manifesto is about. And we have uh, already launched our invitation letter. And as a response, I've received uh, many letters from adolescents from various countries like Bulgaria, Hungary, Portugal, but also the Netherlands. So yeah, we have really received a lot of diverse letters. And so the idea was you wrote a letter. What, what was in that letter then? Uh, well, I actually basically just invite all these youngsters to uh, share their ideas about democracy, for example. Uh, and the, the idea is to then, uh, first of all, the, gather all the letters, bundle it and hand it over to the European Parliament and also uh, yeah, well, maybe like a performance together with them, a Zoom meeting, something so that we can, you know, use their ideas as a source of inspiration for many other youngsters or for, yeah, the European Parliament. 
So it's the uh, idea so that yeah. Young, yeah, the idea that young people start to talk and and give their own voice to what democracy is because they can't vote yet, you know. So that they are yeah. often neglected of are disregarded mm -hmm. because they're too young and still youngsters. Yeah. How important is that young people have a voice in in the democratic change and democratic innovation? Well, I think it is um, very important that they feel heard and that they learn to, uh, you know, cope with feelings, ideas, uh, that they from like uh, uh, the small age on learn to express their opinions, change it if they learn new things. And I think it's really important to start from the beginning on to build a bridge between our democracies and our youngsters that like both sides will grow towards each other and that it isn't like oh you're 18 and now you can vote and you have never done anything except for like one year of democracy lessons and that's just not enough no it's not because suddenly you become 18 that you know how democracy works it's yeah. not an apple i understand and um, and i hope in the breakout session you can also talk talk a little bit about your book towards the people because you wrote a <laughs> book that is everywhere in holland that even the minister uh, talked about it about a new form of democracy very great thank you so much delara have fun in the thank breakout you. session and then last but not least there's more than just people there's also nature remember the uh Atsi, the original uh, people from uh australia that they were voicing out nature as well we are again in a situation where nature actually gets no voice but make sure that we all hear nature so i think we should listen we invited all the way from the netherlands eva rovers she's also from extinction rebellion the worldwide uh, uh activist in climate but also actually in democracy which is very interesting and how can people be part in climate assemblies uh, eva please tell us what is it you're going to talk about well, I'm going to talk about the situation in which, uh, for over which we are in at this time, uh, for over 30 years, uh, governments all over the world, as also in the, in the Netherlands, uh, have failed um, or have been aware of climate change, of biodiversity loss. Uh, but all governments have really failed to respond properly to this growing ecological crisis, and we think people are uh, very much equipped to help those poor politicians who just are stuck in this system in which uh, they have to prioritize short-term electoral gain over long-term needs of uh, current and future generations. So we really need to help these politicians. Um, and you can do so through climate citizens assemblies. Um, uh, this is really an update of the parliamentary uh, democracy that we have uh, at this time. And um, it helps because uh, what, which, what Martin also said, deliberative processes really lead to a more diverse and informed uh, voice in political debates. And um, especially when it comes to uh, climate and ecolo ecological justice, um, politicians need access to uh, public judgments that have um, been reached in an informed way. So um, I think people uh, should help politicians. Uh, let's help them to make these most difficult decisions uh, of, this in, in, of this century. I really like how you, Catherine said, the politicians actually got stuck and they don't want change. And then Eva says, you know, let's help them. Let's just give them their hand Get because the, those poor, those <laughs> poor politicians, you know. But I think it's important, a climate assembly, citizen assemblies, then with the focus on climate, eh? it's, it's an example that can be used in many different uh, topics. But um, I really like the way you are not only fighting for climate in actions, which of course doing, but also in rethinking the system and showing that it can be done as well. On a, on a more constructive level. So for the people who are interested in uh, Eva or what she has to say, please, then you can go to her breakout session. I'm repeating, there are six categories and five people, five people will um, uh, talk, Martin, Moritz, Katrin, Dilara and Eva. Um, and what will happen now is that I will give the word back, word back to uh, Severin because people can go into breakout sessions, talk. We're gonna have two, so 25 minutes and then switch up 25 minutes and then we all come together and have probably the most lovely meetup ever, or completely inspired and richer as ever. So Severin, please tell us how are we gonna do this with all these beautiful people joining this session? 